Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at this forum. Um, this is my topic, negotiating liminal spaces, and I'm looking at the postgrad experience at USP. But before I begin, let me just problematize for a moment and situate our understanding of transformative pedagogies. And I have to say that as someone who works in the area of education and in curriculum in particular, I was a little bit disturbed by, by some of the things that I'd noticed. When we talk about transformative pedagogies, what we're talking about are notions of learning and teaching or theories of learning and teaching. And basically, if we're talking about learning and teaching in the Pacific, then what we're talking about is transforming the way that we teach and we learn in the Pacific classroom to enable our learners to thrive and to enable them to develop resilience, what I call resilience literacies, to allow them to do really well. Um, there are 18 presentations in the VCs forum this year, and one is a keynote, and I will probably get into trouble for this, but I'm always getting into trouble, and I'm quite happily the angry native, so that's all right. There are 18 presentations plus one keynote, so there are 19. 14 of the 18, so that's 77.7% .7 or 78% on, about, or related to new technologies, media, new media, digital technologies, continuing and flexible learning, particularly focusing on blended online learning and teaching. My presentation is one of only five that explores transformative pedagogies without overemphasizing ICT and new media, because it does have a place, as we heard Biman say. It does enhance the learning experience and the teaching experience. But perhaps we ought to, to remember that it, it enhances, it isn't the only way. Um, and so my presentation is one of 19, so it's less than 5%. Um, and I thought that, as I was reflecting over lunch, I thought, wow, maybe the VC's forum should be two and a half days. And that on one day, because, okay, I'm going to be very political here. I looked at the objectives. That's the curriculum planner in me. I always look at objectives and learning outcomes. First one is very general about increasing knowledge of new and transformative pedagogies. It's the second one. That's the E. And so I was wondering whether we could have one day on number one and one day on number two. Sorry, it's just a suggestion. <laughs> just a suggestion. I know it, it's a cost-effective um, uh, issue and, and all of that, but I just thought it was worth mentioning that from a curriculum perspective, if you are talking about learning and teaching, that ICT in its place, and particularly when you're talking about the context of Pacific Island countries and Pacific Island students, so a number of people have been asking me, what does liminal mean? Um, liminal is one of those words that I found and I thought, I also write poetry, so it was one of those words that I wrote down and I thought, I have to use that word, it sounds really nice. That was about 10 years ago. And I found that it just sat there and it was only through my own scholarly exploration that I recognized that it wasn't just a nice sounding word, but it actually had a place in the educational discourse and so this particular presentation situates the postgrad experience as liminal space, which states that students basically over their undergrad experience become familiar with what is expected of them. And then they leave. And when they come back into the postgrad experience, no one really tells them what's expected of them. And so it is, in essence, this threshold or, or transitionary space of being or in betweenness. And the starting point for the discussion is a very small-scale study that I conducted in 2007 with a small sample group of 25 postgrad students. And that initial study is used as a reference point from which a transformative learning and teaching approach has evolved across five offerings of one postgraduate course over the 200, 2010 to 2013 uh, period. And so just a little visual because I love visuals. If we want to understand what I'm talking about in terms of liminality, these are the things that Pacific students are actually experiencing. Well, number one, one of the issues would be the gap or the number of years between the undergrad and the postgrad. And the greater the gap, of course, the greater the level of difficulty. Work experience or lack of, depending on the program that they're enrolled in. Language gap, we heard this morning, is one of the biggest issues that many of us face. Now we're moving uh, increasingly into e-learning, either uh, Moodle support or full-on um, e-learning um, as a mode of delivery. And many of our students are actually digital immigrants and not digital natives, and so they come in with a sense of fear 
Um, and when the teachers or academics themselves are also digital immigrants, it's not a particularly positive learning and teaching experience. A lot of our students are not necessarily widely read in their home countries. We may not have very well-resourced libraries. And then, of course, the last one. And so generally, some students do well, while others continue to experience this sense of, of stress and confusion. And they may shift between periods of high and low academic self-esteem. And so my question was, why do, what do stu our students need in order to move from that liminal space of being unsure and not knowing to a space where they, are, they have a, a strong identity as a postgrad student, they know what's expected of them, and they can actually do very well. Um, the postgraduate experience is a liminal space. We know this, so I don't need to go into too much detail, but basically I wanted to highlight the fact that all of our postgrad students will encounter a combination of both positive and negative learning experiences. And the various discussions I've had with postgrad students over the last seven years indicates that the most negative experience that they've, they've had is that overwhelming feeling that they're out of their depth and not knowing what exactly is expected of them. Many lament the unspoken expectations and assumptions that their lecturers make and the sense of knowing that something more should be happening at postgrad, but they don't know what that is. And so my argument is that this in-betweenness may be viewed as a significant um, liminal space. So the average postgrad classroom we know is diverse. They have diverse learning needs and different preferred learning styles. They're at different levels of their postgrad program. Some may be enrolled in the postgrad diploma in education. They may be enrolled in the masters um, in education by coursework. They've had their positive and negative uh, experiences, and they have different motives for taking up the postgraduate study. And I don't think we recognize that element or that factor when we're talking about student uh, learning. Many may not have thought about the value of the postgrad qualification beyond a promotion or a pay rise or marketability outside of their home country. So they might not have thought about how it will improve or enhance their own learning process if you want to talk about lifelong learning, and the application of that learning in their professional um, practice. So just very quickly, I just wanted to give you a snapshot. This was the 2007 um, study. So I had a range, of course, most of our students are from Fiji. Um, when I asked them about the level of difficulty at completing their postgrad assignments, the vast majority said they had experienced some difficulty with very few of them saying, well, it was kind of average, so-so. When I asked them to, to rate the quality of the support received, the majority of them chose to, to stay on the safe side and say, yeah, you know, kind of, it was kind of average. 24% um, said it was good, only 8% said excellent, and 20% was, said it was poor. When I asked them what kind of academic support they sourced, surprisingly, just over 50% said they consulted with their course coordinators and the vast majority spoke with other students. When I asked them as a follow-up question, aren't you concerned that they, you may be getting the wrong information, they acknowledged that that may be the case, but they were more comfortable with that arrangement. So, And so just really quickly, the self-assessment, how they, they ranked their own skills and competencies against a, com, a list of common postgrad assessment tasks. And what I was interested in is this range in the red. And things that I had assumed um, as an academic here that postgrad students would know how to do. So for example, the annotated bibliography, writing a statement of intent or a research proposal, and various other issues. Just very quickly, the common problems, one in three and one in five, talking about some of the, the basic things we assume a postgrad student can do without much of our help. Or if they don't know, they can find out. We don't really feel responsible at that point. When I asked them about the kind of support that they thought they needed, the two I highlighted in green stood out for me because they were asking for a postgrad, some kind of postgraduate academic support prior to beginning. And some recommended a short course bridging program. And so I was really pleased uh, one of the, uh, my colleagues who was sitting here earlier today also raised that issue of, of bridging uh, programs. When I raised that issue at the school level in 2007, I was told, oh, this is the job of CELT, which is now, of course, student learning services. As, as teaching staff, we don't worry ourselves with student support. 
which if you are talking about transformative uh, pedagogies, kind of contradicts the whole um, philosophical uh, foundation. So this is, these were the core areas that they identified as problematic the lecturers. Timing of classes. In education, our classes are always after four. So it's not unusual to have a class from five to nine or six to nine in the evenings or on Saturdays. Many of them complained about distance, ICT, assessment, reading materials, contact hours, teaching and learning styles, and learning support. So seven years later, what's changed? In 2010, in December of 2010, I was asked to go and teach a flexi school in Lambasa to 11 students. And I thought, well, this is a great opportunity to find out what's changed, because in that period of time, a lot had actually happened in terms of the kinds of support we were giving students and in terms of the programs. Um, and so this kind of gives you the range of, um, of, of students that I had spoken to since 2010, December 2010. What are they saying? Much of the same, unfortunately. We've heard it already today. Moodle and internet access is a problem. ICT know-how. Although students are more comfortable with using the internet and email, accessibility. Writing skill varies. Little or no theoretical understanding. The same thing for methodological understanding. The assessment issues are ongoing. They're still asking for more discussion opportunities. They're complaining of little applied learning opportunities through guided learning. And I have to qualify that. When they talked about guided learning and I asked them what they meant, they said, we don't mean that you're going to hold our hand. We mean that you give us clear instructions so that when we leave, we know exactly what you want us to do. And for me, that kind of stood out. Um, irrelevant materials, content, lack of correlation or connectedness to specific realities, um, lack of materials, and some of them still mention the coordinators. So throughout that, that process of gathering that information, I kind of went through my own personal reflection, trying to understand my role in providing a transformative learning experience for post-grad students. And of course, my starting point was my personal philosophy of teaching, which comprises my own understandings as a teacher educator and a curriculum practitioner. And the questions that I've always been asking is, what is education for in the Pacific? What is higher education for? Why do Pacific Islanders get a postgraduate degree? And of the postgrad experience, both as a student and teacher, my own learning experiences, seven years of teaching uh, teenagers at a secondary school in Fiji and 15 years of teaching here at USB. I have some understanding of the Pacific students' learning styles, some understandings of the predominant teaching styles, some understandings of adult learning. Oops. I think the computer is telling me that I need to speed it up. Um, some understanding of curriculum gaps and the culture and language gap. And I have my own expectations of myself as a teacher who is meant to be facilitating and empowering, providing empowering learning experiences rather than a transmission or banking kind of style of transmission. So I have those expectations of myself. And then, of course, I have to be informed by the wider educational discourse and what are people saying. And while I am not myself particular about which goji you want to quote, Pedagogy, when we talk about pedagogy, really refers to theories of learning and teaching for children. Um, and when we are talking about adult learners, which is what I would assume my postgrad students to be, I need to be thinking about how adults learn and know that is quite different to how children learn and know, how a primary school child would learn and know, and how a secondary school child would learn and know. And then, of course, getting into the more technical, self-determined, self-directed, and then what everyone else seems to be very passionate about, digital new technologies, inspired by what other people are saying. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I just wanted to draw your attention to the very last three lines at the bottom. As instructors, we must focus our attention on creating an environment where students can gain knowledge and skills in critical thinking and problem solving in their chosen areas of learning. I like the first one because it talks about cognitive and emotional life, and I worry that if we, if we go the full e-learning distance, that we are focusing and prioritizing cognitive skills, and what we, what we understand to be non-cognitive skills, which is the affective and the psychomotor skills, well, we become sedentary and we lose all of our socialization skills, and we exist in e-communities, but in real life we are dysfunctional. I worry about that. I don't want my children to be like that. 
I try to enact this in my classroom and I'm guided by this quintessential question. I know that content knowledge is important, but is there something else that I should be delivering at the postgrad level that's markedly different to what I do at the undergrad level? And how should that inform what I do in the classroom? So I've come to the, the conclusion or the assumption that both assessment of learning, and I've put little uh, definitions there, it's getting a bit technical here, and assessment for learning have a place in the transformative classroom. One is the more summative that's designed to gauge your students' learning at the end of an academic period or the end of a unit or the end of a topic. Um, whereas assessment for learning is, is more the guided learning and it's designed to enhance the learning experience so you learn through the assessment. The assessment is not the end, right? So my belief is that assessment for learning is transformative reflexive praxis and through it students can then monitor their own development. So these are my very brief notes. Um, I have five groups of students in this course, ED457, which is Education in Small Island Developing States, offered in Lambasa, um, at Laudala, face-to-face mode, in Tonga is a flexi school. Yes, I'm, I'm getting to the end, don't worry. <laughs> Sorry about that. And then, of course, RMI. So when I apply the AFL, these are the kinds of things that, that I try to do provide them with a guided learning experience and finding that there, is, there are two things that are critical to this assessment for learning. The first one is recognizing the importance of a diagnostic written exercise at the beginning of the course. Once you've delivered the course overview, finding out where the students are at because that can tell you their prior learning, their knowledge, their expression, communication, critical thinking skills, and then varying across the deliveries, various continuous assessments. Templates have come in really, really handy. Taking time to mark drafts, if the class is small enough, you can do that, giving them a resubmission option, an active learning uh, opportunity, so actually engaging in a hands-on policy analysis, just as an example. My own reflections, these are three of the big problems. Communication, attitude, and the approach to learning. Language is definitely a really big problem. Um, attitude. Some want the rope learning, give me the information and I will memorize it and I'll study for the exam. Um, some of them fight for half a mark at postgrad, I couldn't get over that. And some expect to do well <laughs> without much personal effort. And so I'm just gonna show you some of the pictures of some of the activities and this is across the campuses rather than talking through it. So we had classes in a hut when there was a power outage in the marshals, final exams, of course, assessment of learning. Policy analysis, actually using very, very easy technology, just using the Adobe PDF um, search function to look for phrases and coding and the patterns that emerge. Problem solving approaches, online searches. We heard from Adish that the Cook Islands campus and I agree is a beautiful campus. They don't have a library. Seriously, pedagogy, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> So I get there and I find out that the, the, the Ministry of Education in the Cook Islands this year issued free laptops to every single teacher in the Cook Islands, fully loaded. Every school is Wi-Fi free. None of the teachers know how to look for scholarly or academic articles online. They're still using Wikipedia. So that was that particular focused online search. These are the databases. This is how you go through the process. And then, of course, teaching them how to develop their own conceptual framework. Funnily enough, I know that grades are not the answer, but because I noticed the transformation in the students, I also noticed that the grades were beginning to change. Lambasa, the lowest grades, three Bs. Students were excited, they wanted to apply in their own classroom. Tonga was by far the most successful, lowest two B pluses. Overwhelming. RMI, one C plus. This was the hardest one to teach. Language, just connecting every day, I had to repeat myself five or six times, you know, but the students were committed and at the end, only one C plus, first time postgrad student with serious language difficulties, but really wanted to keep trying. And so I was really pleased with his result that he managed to pass. Laudala, on the other hand, is my problem. Students think we have all the resources, so poor time management, and I know we can resubmit and remark, but I'll just give it in before the exam. 
So you can see the grades reflect that attitude, except for the VBC option where I had one EX because the teacher had been transferred from the campus site to an outer island and he couldn't uh, continue in the course. At the end of the course, they all tell me, this was awesome, but man, it was a lot of work. <laughs> and I find it really interesting that this year I had one student who tagged along to the first session with his good friend. He had already done his six units. He was conceptualizing his statement of intent and he told me, this will be my seventh course and it's okay, it'll just be my extra and then I'll do my intent. For me, I felt, wow, I must be doing something right. The research must be telling me something. And then I had a, a, a Marshall Island student saying, this is my fifth course and this is the first time, this her words, that I have learned the methodology of these activities. I have learned more than content. Another one which I thought was amusing, now I know why I never got the grades I thought I deserved. <laughs> General comments, can I contact you beyond the course? Why? Well, the lessons learned, I know that assessment for learning can be applied whatever logical sense you want to use, whatever word. I'm on the last one now. So my question then to all of you is, how do our students learn best? How do we effectively teach them to think critically and creatively for themselves on par with what we expect of a postgrad student? Prior knowledge is obviously at the core of constructivism, and I believe that if we guide them appropriately, the results can be astounding. I think that our students Maybe we need to look at criteria, entry recruitment. Maybe we need to look at our uh, orientation programs. Maybe our students are just not making use of wonderful student support opportunities that are already there. This is my final one. Why assessment for learning? And I have three answers. None of them is e-learning. One, it works. Two, the classroom is transformed and I become an active participant in their learning. My relationship with my students has changed. Possible potential outcomes, and this is awesome, I see the visible change in confidence, both in the oral and written work, and willingness for applied learning, even if they have to work harder. Last one, a number of students, even in the exams, write coherently, critically, theoretically, better than some academic papers that I've reviewed. So as a facilitator of learning, I can't ask for any more. Thank you.